All right. So, um, can everyone, for one, see the uh, slide presentation up on the wall? It says Artgate with the artwork behind there. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And um, I'll just, I'm just going to mention when I actually change the slide. Um, and if it's not changing for everyone, uh, just speak up there so I'm not um, leaving anybody. <laughs> but, okay. um, so, I guess I'll just start by introducing myself. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Brendan McNaughton. Um, I'm an internationally recognized contemporary artist. Uh, most people know me for my large scale bronze, marble, and aluminum sculptures. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of Artgate VR, which is a virtual reality marketplace for post-war and contemporary art. Um, so, just with respect to the context of um, the Education and VR Summit. I'm going to be kind of gearing this towards um, education and art history and how virtual reality is sort of intersecting with those two worlds. So from a personal experience um, in the 2010s, um, when I was studying art history, um, this was what art history looked like to me. Um, it was a Xerox copy of a textbook um, dense text, little black and white photographs of the artworks. Um, and this is how I learned about art history. We have Jasper Johns and Andy Warhol, two really famous art artists in, uh, in this slide here. And these artworks are massive pieces. The only way I would get a sense of scale is if I looked at the fine print in the bottom of those artworks. And I, I looked at um, I looked at the dimensions, and then I thought with my head, okay, what is 136 inches by 100 inches look like? And then I also have to try to imagine it in color. Um, and for me, I'm a very, very visual learner. Um, I, I think a big reason why a lot of people are gravitated to the arts, because they, they are attracted by the visual nature of a lot of the artworks that they get to experience. So I always had this disconnect with the love for artwork and wanting to know more and wanting to learn more. But then this medium that was so far from what the actual artwork looked like. And these Xerox copies are actually better versions than some of the, some of the uh, uh, images that I had to look at. And so you couldn't even see what the artwork was in some instances. So you're just sitting there reading. Um, and for me, it was a, a really unengaging way to experience art history. And I pushed through it because I loved it and I wanted to learn it. But I know that just presenting art in this format is something that would turn a lot of people away from wanting to learn anymore. Um, so um, another interesting thing to note about how I was studying art history and being taught art history when I was in university is that this was a required course textbook that I needed. Um, and even though it was a copy of a textbook, this, um, this book that I studied from still was very, very expensive to get. And some of the textbooks and required readings that I had to get are actually more expensive than the VR headsets and the devices that I'm using today to go through virtual reality and experience art. So this is really what art history and learning art history and learning about artwork looked like in the 2010s. And this is now where art history is in my mind. This is how I experience art and how I experience art history. Um, so really art history in the 2010s went from the textbook to a decade later, art history in the 2020s goes into the metaverse or into virtual reality. And the difference here is it's pretty straightforward. Like you get to see this stuff at scale in full color. You get to walk around it. Um, like even if it's a three dimensional artwork, you can just kind of go and stroll around the artwork and experience it. So it's one thing to have a, like a nice visual experience um, to study and to learn in. Um, but another, another component that the metaverse is opening up is this exact thing that we're experiencing as a group here today. We have, we have people 
that are all in a room um, from all over the world and we can socialize and we can share ideas with one another. Um, and a big thing with the arts is that ability to share art and to share culture and to share ideas. Um, and sometimes that conversation that's stimulated between people just from seeing and experiencing an artwork is the thing that makes an artwork really, really enjoyable to experience. So um, to be able to have this context for the future generations to be experiencing and learning about artwork, um, I think is, is going to be a very, very um, interesting chapter. So, um, really what virtual reality and the metaverse is doing to the arts and, and really what it's doing to um, art history and education as a whole is giving remote access to it. So whether it's art or any other type of education, you can access it remotely now. So I'm gonna stay focused on my vein of expertise, which is art and art history. So um, remote access to art is so incredibly important. Um, it, like I am very, very lucky to have the, the success that I've had throughout my, my career in the arts. And I've gotten to, to go to, to Venice and to New York and to Shanghai and all over the world. And every time I go there, I go into the museums and I see the artwork. And it is such an incredible way to gain a perspective of ideas and culture and knowledge. And, um, and there is still so much that I miss. I've only, uh, I've been to the Venice Biennale one time, which is a major, major art festival. And I want to go every single year, but I can't necessarily afford the flights and the accommodation and all the time that's needed um, to go to just that one international event. So if we start putting more and more artwork into virtual reality, then all of a sudden that, that need for these international flights and that, that level of access... Um, it just disappears, right? Like it's accessible to um, whoever can get their hands on on a computer, a cell phone, or a virtual reality headset. Now the art world is open to it. So um, this this technology that is that is coming right now is really opening up remote access to the arts. Um, and and this um, this image that we're looking at is an actual. Uh, this is a, a screenshot um, of some of the virtual reality development that we have going on. Um, this is um, actual development that's going on with ArcGate VR um, within our platform. And so you can see the, the visual quality that we're getting now. And, and you have to keep in mind, too, where this technology is going. This is just where we're at right now. So we're, we're at a pretty good visual standpoint, um, but we're going to be able to continue to push that further. And at one point, you're going to be walking through a gallery in the real world or walking through a gallery in virtual reality, and you won't even be able to distinguish visually the difference between the two of them. So um, with respect to access to the arts um, relative to education, um, think about a class field trip. Typically, a high school or a university um, or any educational context, if you would want to go to a museum to check out uh, an art exhibition, um, they would have to contact uh, all the different parents to get them to sign off to let the students go. You'd have to organize buses. You'd have to get passes to the museum. And that was really only limited to the local museum that was nearby. Um, so with this level of access to art, you can now do virtual reality field trips and, and check out exhibitions from all over the world. Um, another, another great thing that can take place with that is you can say your class is studying the Renaissance, um, Italian art history, for example. Um, they could go in to check out a collection of Italian artworks, and then they could have an art historian from Italy pop up and and tell the class about about these specific works. So you can actually get access to um, a far more diverse 
um, like grouping of, of knowledge and teaching and education. Um, and this kind of rolls into the idea of a distributed classroom too. Um, if I want to learn Italian art history, would I not want to just pop into an art historian's class that is, that is very, very focused in Italian art? And I can do that without having to leave Toronto, which is my home. Um, and then I could take my headset off and continue on. Um, so, um, and one more thing that's kind of on the horizon of what we're working on is uh, the idea of recorded lessons and tours. Um, so we're already organizing tours. Um, so sometimes it's artists, sometimes it's curators, art historians. Um, they'll what they'll do is they'll um, create. They'll they'll get people to come into our gate and they'll give them a tour of the collection that they have on exhibition. And um, this has been a really exciting thing for us because we can really see how these ideas and these artworks get shared very internationally um, through this medium. Um, but one thing that could happen too is you can start um, you can start recording them. So say you didn't have a chance to actually make it into the uh, into the tour, you can go into that room at a later date and then just press play, and then that artist will now give you the tour again. So it's a way to kind of leave breadcrumbs for um, for future generations to learn sometimes directly from the artist. Because uh, uh, like think about how cool it would be if you could just pop into a gallery space and you could have Andy Warhol himself walking you through his collection and telling you about his artwork or Pablo Picasso or, uh, you know, any artist of the, through all of history, you could just go and meet them and then they can, they can take you on a tour. Um, so really this is, this is this archive um, that we're getting, that we're building right now. Um, that's, that's here for future generations to enjoy. And, and it's just sort of the early days, the building blocks of, of uh, what's going on right now. So um, I'm going to, uh, I don't really have too much more to say, so I'm going to kind of leave it on a, a concluding question here. And it's, it's really one of, if you have the idea or the possibility, um, sorry, if you have the choice of being able to read through art history or being able to walk through art history, which one would you want to do? And I think that from an educational standpoint, there's going to be a lot of like a lot of students and a lot of people that are going to be far more engaged with walking through art history as opposed to reading it in a black and white textbook. And um, really, I'm excited to watch this chapter unfold and to and to help shape it with everybody else that's involved with uh, um, this this movement that is taking place. So that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty well it. <laughs> just, a, just a quick one. But um, so if there is anybody that is interested in what we're doing, um, definitely feel free to, to reach out to us. There's my email address. Um, or if you want to download our gate VR, um, you can use that web address at the bottom. Um, we're available on the Oculus Go and the Oculus Quest. Um, and we're, we're hoping to, to be out on more platforms too. We've been loving this experience with hubs. Um, so maybe one day we'll have a little bit more accessible through, uh, the hubs links as well. Um, but for right now, uh, this is, this is where we're at with it. So, um, if you have an Oculus Go, if you have an Oculus Quest and you want to get involved, uh, just download it and come on out to some of the events that we have going on. Um, it's always great to see new people join in and, and attend, and uh, especially if there's any educators that are looking um, to do some virtual field trips to, to see collections from around the world, um, we'd be really, really interested in, in chatting with them. And that is that. Clap, 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 clap. That's awesome. <laughs> I, it really resonated with me when you were talking about... Um, being you know, like having to read art history from a book um like that like the little pictures and stuff because i definitely took a bunch of art classes and it's not the same at all it like it's a completely different experience to actually see it in its proper scale and everything so that's amazing
Yeah. It's either that or there's a slides and a, it's usually a monotone voice art historian talking about the artwork. Imagine uh, like the artist themselves is telling you about their work. They're all excited. They know all these little details, intricate things. Yeah. And then you can just press play and let them do their tour. Um, that, you know, that's a, that's a future that's being built right now. And yeah. I feel like there's some really cool opportunities for um, like kind of contextualizing art as well, like being able to make like sort of really specific sort of mini gallery tours where you also like can add like contextual information about what the artist is responding to, et cetera, and like multimedia. And um, yeah, I just there's so much potential there. That's really cool. Yeah, it's, it's really just the foundation right now, um, what's going on here. But it's it's so much fun um, watching the, the collections develop and the audiences um, coming in and, and all the different people that are really connecting through it. It's really, really incredible to see. Um, when I was in university, you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in university, one of my favorite uh, art history classes was we got to go to the Art Gallery of Ontario, which is a giant art gallery here in Toronto. It's probably the biggest one in Ontario, I guess. Um, but we got to go into the archives and see how they preserve. And uh, um, it was something that most people wouldn't be able to do. And that experience was just incredible, seeing all this artwork that was in the archives that day sometimes. Like, there's some artworks that have been in that collection for... Oh, Sam, I need the light on. <laughs> lost track in for a bit um yeah no there, there's this collection that nobody's seen for probably 50 years that we were able to access as students and if we bring it into vr anybody can have access to it and learn about it um and there's billions of dollars that are in vaults that are that aren't being shown of artwork that's not mm -hmm. being shown yeah it's really, uh, like, if you think about it, though, or, like, putting an artwork into a museum or into an exhibition, especially if it's a really, really important work, uh, that, like, people don't want to do that. They, they typically want to, if it's a really, really important work, they just keep it in a vault that doesn't even see the light of day because they don't want the UV light hitting the surface yeah. of the artwork and degrading the paint because they want it to last for another thousand years, so... I say let the artwork sit in the vaults. Um, it, like, yeah, we will definitely still have the, the museums where people can come and see it, but you can you can keep things stored and stored and safe and secure. Um, but you can also have a hyper hyper public and accessible um, virtual reality layer on top of all the artwork that exists in the world. Hmm. Yeah, we were, um, there was a presentation by um, some folks from Sketchfab the other day, and it was interesting because they had a statue of King Tut or something. I can't remember what it was, but like a 3D model of it. And yeah, they were saying that if you go to see it in real life, it's going to be up high and really far out of reach. And that if you do it in VR, you can like grow it and shrink it and play with it. And, you know, you're obviously not able to touch it, but you can get so much closer to it. It's like almost in some ways it's, it's better than seeing it in real life because you can actually get that much closer to it. Yeah. And uh, that's that's sort of the thing that's that there's a possibility for is you have this, you know, it's an incredible context um, to go into a major museum and look at the artworks. But uh, say you go to see the Mona Lisa, you have to wait in line to get into the Louvre then you have to wait in line to see the Mona Lisa. Then there's mm -hmm. a crowd of people around and security guards and flashes and bulletproof glass in front of it. Is that really the ideal viewing context? Um, there's there's a lot of um, a lot of additional benefits to being able to create your own digital space around the artworks and digital mm -hmm. viewing um, platform there. So we're trying to, um, to just trying to make um, an even better experience than in real life in some circumstances. This also makes me think of the four paintings you have by Aaron Laurie. Um, yeah. There are these four paintings from a, a series of paintings by the artist Aaron Laurie that are all connected, but they've never actually been in the same room at the same time. And in, uh, in Artgate, 
those four paintings, which are four parts of a whole, actually get to be together, even though they all belong to different collectors and galleries now. Oh, wow. That's and, cool. And that's the artist that did the very colorful painting. That uh, I'm curious, by doing this, um, should, you should be pushing a little further, right? I mean, you, you should be changing the very art um, display the industry altogether. There's really no need for a museum anymore, right? You could, you could have this thing, you know, like you know, like a, you know, like the garden or, or something where you have, you know, these kind of sculpture pieces and things. You know, you can just arrange them however you want. So does that get back to how things are supposed to be displayed according to the artist? I'm just kind of wondering, you know, going both ways, what you can do to 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 try to do the things that you know displays the way it was before and how the artists wanted to show it versus how people wanted to see it isn't there going to be some kind of you know especially with the art dealers i can imagine them having a cow over this at this point <laughs> yeah well actually one of the things that we're doing right now um since this is in context of the educators in vr uh summit um we did take more of an educational uh kind of perspective to this presentation um, but we are we are definitely um, the engine behind our platform is uh, this inquiry button. Uh, it's not in any of the uh, any of these slides, but there's a little eye uh, info button in on a, a little kiosk in every single room. When you walk up to that, it has all the information about all the artworks and an inquiry button for any artwork you're interested in. You press that button, you're automatically put in touch with whoever's selling the artwork if the artwork is up for sale. And you can close a transaction through VR. So um, you could throw your headset on, walk through this gallery space, inquire about that blue headpiece, and then um, do a deal all through within your VR headset or over your computer. And the artwork will get shipped to you, and the cash will be given over to the dealer. So it's it's really changing the economics um, of the art world. It's changing the idea and the role that a gallery plays. Um, in this world. Um, so that's sort of the engine behind the platform is the ability to buy and sell artwork. Um, yeah, that's true. Comment, and just to comment on how you were saying, um, like the way it can be displayed, like it can be displayed in a garden or something along those lines. Um, there is a certain reason why when you go to a museum, they all have a similar look and feel because it almost... Uh, celebrates the artwork in a certain way and that's the goal and it's the purpose is to celebrate the artwork and make it make it stand out um and that's we want to maintain that ideology that that the art looks and feels like a piece of art as opposed to just like something that's cool in the garden and when you, we start what's reality it starts in a virtual world. You lose that connection to a certain degree, and there, there's a certain respect for the artwork that will get lost. So we're trying to maintain as much of a going to the gallery experience as possible, but it's in a virtual reality environment. Yeah, that's the, but there's two sides to that. I'm saying that there's, whereas, you know, you have... The way it's being presented versus how the artist sees it versus how you know anybody else wants to play with it, right? They might want yeah, to like I mean, they might want to take a piece of art and say, "Okay, I can do better. I can put an arm on this thing and all that." Oh, so the the artworks that are in are in um, on exhibition. They're all real artworks from the real world. Um, so if you have a a collection of artworks you can put it in there and um so there isn't really any artworks that don't exist in the physical world um one of the one of the funny things that happens with us is um there's a lot of um people that are digital sculptors and, and virtual reality art, art creators and they they are so excited about our platform um, but it actually works out easier for us um, for paintings and sculptures and physical world-based artworks um, than the digital pieces. 
Um, so it, it's not as much of a, a sandbox kind of thing as uh, as I think I might be understanding the question to be of yours there, Bill, or or what you were mentioning. No, no, it's just I'm I'm doing something similar to that here in Scottsdale, so people can come visit all the place. So my what I'm going to do with the makerspace is we got a 3D scanner, and we're going to just go around town scanning the hell out of everything as yeah. a crowdsource thing, right? Yeah. So people so people can visit, you know, all the bars. They can visit, like, all the the whole bit, right? Yeah, and, in your world. Yeah, literally. And so the problem was a lot of people, especially the kids, going, oh, you know, this looks like this. You know, I want to attach this to my version of it. So... I thought that was pretty funny. How huh? then the artist came out and said, "No, no, no, no! You can't do this. That's not the way it's intended." And the kids are going, "So," yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and because because it's virtual, it could be different depending on what you need to look like. Mm -hmm. that, that that's what I'm saying. I think that it's going to be an interesting um, future when somebody says, "I don't like your artwork. I want it green instead of purple or whatever." And I guess the artists have to be ready for that. That was actually, um, that came up in the talk that Thomas Flynn did the other day about cultural archiving in, um, in, in virtual reality and, and talking about how at Sketchfab they've gotten um, photogrammetry uh, photos and, and, and sculptures and stuff that um, have then been disputed by the original artist who said that, you know, they don't want their art shared on Sketchfab and freely available. So um, they prescribed to, um, I'm not sure exactly what the... The license is, but basically, um, you know, if the original owner can test it, then it will come down off of Sketchfab. But that is an interesting challenge about, like, who owns a scan of public art that you do in the world. Yeah, and it could be opposite, too. I mean, you look at an artist like Banksy. Right? Yeah, and at some point, something from VR could even come into the real world. Uh, at, if we have some kind of copy and paste-like function within VR, I could copy this tree, paste it onto my computer, 3D print it, conceivably at some point. Oh, I saw an art piece once. I've got a book um, where they took, uh, they had people draw out household objects in uh, like a tool like tilt brush, and then they 3D printed them and they ended up with like these really wild looking like VR painted chairs and stuff like that. They were super cool. Anyways, um, completely unrelated, but they were like super, I'm trying to find a picture of them um, <laughs> online now, but they were really funny. Head is three printed. Yeah, I have to give you this funny story. We we found a a a, 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 a painting by that was something somebody found literally a garage, for, um, somewhere where they had this this painting that looked like it was it was just a pizza. And then we had this thing. We had a meetup at the same time that they were auctioning it. Where people would go off and make a pizza that looked like the painting, and, the, <laughs> and and these art people coming in with their million dollar bids and stuff like that just had a cow. It was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's a very wild world. <laughs> so, I think that a lot of uh, a lot of the mystery of the art world comes from a lack of access to a lot of people. Um, unfortunately the artworks that seem to get the most uh, attention and publicity are only ones that, that have a lot of uh, um, just like a huge collector base behind them. And that's mm -hmm. what really allows them to come onto the international stage. So um, that's one of the things that the art world is now open up to through, through what we're doing. Now, anybody, regardless of there's market viability for your artwork or not, you have this international exhibition context. You have museum grade exhibition spaces at your fingertips, um, and and we think that by opening up this world to anybody that wants to participate, we got a, a new art movement in in the motion. This seems like um, it could be like like I, I just I keep thinking about the Canadian Art Bank. Um, as you're presenting this about like how, you know, the, the government of Canada buys up and like in this program related to the Canada Council for the Arts buys up a whole bunch of really like historically significant art. I mean, it's, it's not all like, um, like classic art or anything, but uh, definitely like things that are really interesting and, and should be seen by like people across Canada because it's like a government owned um, program um, to like lease out the, these like 
Canadian artists' work um, and about how people just don't get an opportunity to see them. And like this makes me really excited to think about the possibility of those being available in a virtual space, even if you can't see them in real life, because yeah. there's no physical gallery associated with it. And, and not even not even just for Canadians, it's, it's for anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. and, and I think that it really kind of, it just opens up the world. Uh, it opens up all this artwork to anybody. And then they can also physically be, well, not physically, but be in the, in the digital room together. So then yeah. they can have an international dialogue really easily too. Yeah. So it, it's like, if you think about the cost associated with doing an, like a globally touring exhibition, you would have to be like a Picasso or a Warhol or, you know, a, Rembrandt in order to warrant an exhibition like that um, and most artists aren't there so most artists don't have any real international exposure until now so I suppose there, is, oh, oh go ahead yeah sorry see guys I'm a pretty old guy I actually had a chance to actually meet Warhol um, in oh the, no way one of these, one of these openings in, in New York and yeah. he actually talked about exactly what you're saying he had a very, very purposeful, because um, I don't really study art, unfortunately, but he actually got me involved in, you know, thinking about art. But basically what he said, this whole idea of everybody can be famous for 15 minutes mm -hmm. was that he actually had this thing called the factory. He didn't very spend familiar. any time, he didn't spend <laughs> any time actually making the paintings. What he was doing was going around promoting, but the way he made his money was going to every celebrity and saying, we can come up with a custom painting just for you. Yeah. But then we'll keep a few that we'll sell out, uh, outside of this. Anybody yeah. could have gotten a Warhol painting if they had like 10 grand or something. Uh, yeah. And then towards the end, he would actually just take your picture, took him like 10 minutes or whatever, and he hand it to his, uh, screen print. to his assistant, <laughs> yeah. would screen print it. And then inside a day, you could have a Warhol painting for, of yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of people that had that. And he actually offered to do it. I said, I'm not going to give you 10 grand. I said, I'll give you five. <laughs> you should bear a Warhol painting. <laughs> <laughs> Hindsight's 2020, well, right? <laughs> well, 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 he actually took more right now. What's funny was he, he actually took the picture of these saying, well, when you make enough money, come back. You know, but, <laughs> yeah. That's wild. But, but my point is, I think you need to kind of look at it like a Warhol where okay what's going to happen when everybody's got their own take on this stuff mm -hmm. and where you make the money is really selling the custom stuff the stuff that is um you know where where the where you some the essence of that person is in the painting and you're selling it back to them and then the more people that had your paintings the more it would it would you know um i forgot what they call it it's a word that says uh increase in you know, prominence. How many yeah the provenance mm -hmm. of the painting so so by pushing the, the ability to get custom versions of this stuff um, would be interesting. And you could actually have a robot that kind of does the painting itself. Right? I mean, <laughs> Bill, you read my mind. <laughs> so <laughs> listen, um, like when I started off, I said that I, I'm, a con, uh, I'm a contemporary artist, right? Um, and Art Gate VR has spun out of my art practice. Um, I actually have... Um, a huge exhibition of artworks in there and an even bigger exhibition of artworks that's coming. Um, and all of the artworks that are in there um, are hooked up to an, a, a network of 3D printers and, um, and marble carving robots. And so you can walk through, you can look at the pieces in the real world, in the virtual space. And then when you, when you order the artwork, it's a pre-order. So two months later, the marble sculpture will show up at your doorstep. Um, so it, it's really, Andy Warhol has been a huge inspiration to me. Um, and his idea of the factory, it's kind of, what's the, what's the contemporary version of the factory? Well, it's, you know, it's the automated factory. It's the, it's the Tesla Gigafactory is the contemporary factory. So rather than having physical human assistants screen printing, you have digital robot assistants carving marble for you. So... Um, a lot of the artwork that I'm involved with is in direct dialogue with this idea of the factory and, and rolling into contemporary times. Um, so, yeah, I, I like where your ideas and your head's going with that stuff. And um, I've totally thought of <laughs> a lot of the stuff that you're exploring there.
Yeah, just don't do like Bill Gates. You know what he did? He bought these original paintings, had it scanned, and then all around his house, he would have these big screen TVs. That was the image of a painting that he owned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because he probably wants to keep them down and stored safely in his vault and not and not have them damaged or have to insure them. Yeah, so so the, <laughs> the, and the reason for that was that he wanted people to visit his house and have their own uh, style of paintings on the wall. He didn't want to like move stuff around. So he would say, "Oh, what kind of paintings do you like?" And then he just put it up on the screen. Then I just switch over to abstract because this person likes abstract, or they like Rothko, so put up a bunch of Rothkos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did you see? Did you see the the play with Rothko? No. It's called Red. They actually made a a, a whole uh, you know drama thing, a, a play about him, where him and his yeah. assistant and showing how nuts he was and the whole bit. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the play. No. I uh, so. How did you, you, you went out to one of Andy Warhol's art openings and met him there, Bill? Yeah, I, um, I, see, I'm pretty old. I got into town in 69 when I was about 12, 12 or 13. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and I came like, what, within seconds of going to, to uh, you know, the, to, to all these places. But, yeah, I got to see Hair as my first musical. Um, but, yeah, it was a strange time. But the thing was, is that people back in those times, they didn't think they were really, you know, they didn't think any of their stuff was going to stick. Yeah. They didn't realize that, right? And they were just, just doing stuff. Just having some fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it, you think things are bad now. It was a lot worse back then. Yeah. You know, they had the draft. They had, like, you know, the whole, you know, this, this is nothing compared to what was going on in the 60s. Yeah. Um, I, I, I really loved uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um Partly because, <laughs> partly because when I was starting off in the arts, I was so broke I didn't know what to do. But he, like, I heard that Basquiat, like, he was living on the streets and he was making artwork on pieces of trash he found in dumpsters and in the alleyways. Yeah. And like, oh, if he could do it, I could do it. No, I, I, no, no actually, the people at Warhol told me about him, and, he, and I actually bought a couple of postcards from him. Oh and yeah, it was like it was it was. I'm just going, man. This guy was a real bullshitter, I tell you. So what, yeah, it was, I mean, this, this, I don't know if he was on drugs or whatever, but he, he was, was like, probably on drugs. He overdosed at 27 on heroin. So yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess if I would have, uh, well, I, I, problem was I sent all the postcards and it was like promptly thrown in the trash. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I should probably stop listening to the stories because I'm going to start hoarding everything now just in case. <laughs> 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 oh that's the really problem, funny you, the problem is you never know the, the the problem you never know you know what's going to be famous or whatever you know unless you had like you know a friend of stiglitz or something and i think <laughs> by what is going to happen with the internet age is that you know people like stiglitz and all that can still you know you could be the next stiglitz right being able to promote these artworks it's really all in terms of promotion really um yeah. And, you know, that and using Google to do the image search. Oh, yeah. So, wow. Yeah, that's fun times, huh? <laughs> yeah, really. It's it's really, an, I, I'm, every single day I wake up, I'm just so excited to see the next thing that happens. And, uh, like, it is just wild, the, the pace of change that's this happening right now. I, I can't believe, who knows how many thousands of kilometers are between all of us right now. Oh my but goodness! <laughs> we're all here in a digital space together, looking at, you know, looking at these artworks, and yeah, well, it's well, it's pretty other, crazy. Well, the other thing that is completely different this time around, I think, <laughs> is that it used to be, you know, you had these salons and all of that, and and you know, only the rich people determined what art was, right? Yeah. So, so you have that, but it wasn't global. No. But now you have basically a global scheme. So all the artworks around the world and artists from around the world can get involved mm -hmm. with just the internet connection, right? Basically, that's the and only limiter. Yeah, and I don't think that's been tapped at all in terms of, you know, being able to take, you know, stuff and mix it around and all of that. If you just take a look at, like, world music and how they were able to do stuff, but, but they were limited by the by the promoters. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, you can break through all that and, and it's just really an amazing age right now. That's why I wish I was 20 years younger to be able to do the, 
Boy, it's, fun. <laughs> it's it's so much fun. <laughs> but you still got your finger on the pulse of it, there, Bill. You're we're oh, we're literally on the bleeding edge of of all of this, and uh, like even Elgin, like she's just showing me all this hubs, and uh, like every day there's just some some new avenue to ex to explore. It's wild how fast everything's unfolding. Yeah, but so I'm looking forward to checking out our gate. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it looks really cool. Yeah, yeah, I just have I just have a final thought. You know, back, you know, the, all the stuff with art and all of this stuff, it's sort of good news, bad news. Is that, you know, it used to be you had people trying to to say this is what's good and what's bad. Those people are all gone, mm -hmm. so there there's no limit, which is good and bad, I guess. You know, in terms of, you know, what you're able to do and not, you know, stuff that. Oh, anyway, I'm just saying that. It, maybe a good and bad thing depending on you know sort of like there's no adults in charge anymore and you know the the you know the crazy people have taken over the, the asylum kind of thing <laughs> but, well, but i'm looking forward to it it's going to be great <laughs> it'll be a fun chapter <laughs> it's really yeah. nice to meet you there bill um, all right thank you i'll keep in touch yeah definitely uh we're in discord and check out our site and the whole nine and yeah okay cool cool Thanks. Have a good nice one. chatting with you, Brendan. Yeah, Elgin, thank you so much for uh, getting me involved with this and show me hubs, and uh, I really appreciate it. It's uh, it's been really fun just to have this whole moment 